Uh, I just want to say that it's such a personal pleasure for me and for Brad, who's unfortunately not here, to host uh, Koki Roberts tonight. I think this is, Koki, your sixth or seventh author talk at Politics and Prose. I know you've been here for three previous books, uh, all of which, by the way, were New York Times bestsellers. I think we have a couple of them, if not all of them, up front if you missed them on the first go round. And uh, Koki's also been here several times uh, with her husband, Steve Roberts, um, for books they've written together. Uh, and some of you may know, maybe not all of you, that along with many, many other awards, Koki was named by the Library of Congress as a living legend. <laughs> living, living, key living. Both are important. Legend is good. Living is better. Um, and I just was going to say that here at PNP, we, we actually think of her as one of our own legends because she's an author with such deep roots in our Washington community. So if you'll uh, permit us tonight, we're going to call her a living legend and a local legend, um, at least for this event. And that does seem uh, particularly appropriate because tonight she'll be discussing her new book, Capital Dames, The Civil War and the Women of Washington, 1848 to 1868. Uh, Koki is, of course, best known as one of our nation's most respected broadcast journalists. Her commentaries on NPR and ABC News offer critical insights into the worlds of politics, government, and Washington. And um, as is the case with every campaign season, she'll undoubtedly be one of the most important voices that we all listen to in the months ahead as the 2016 presiden presidential race unfolds. And I know how busy you're going to be uh, trying to cover. Listen, by the time we're done tonight, five more Republicans. Will be <laughs> exactly. I was going to say, you have there's a cast of candidates that keeps growing forever. So, uh, But I do, I do want to mention that, that NPR and ABC are just her day job. Um, you know some of you that Koki grew up in a political family. She has seen political life uh, from the inside and out. She understands where political dynamics fit into American history. And uh, for that reason, it's perhaps not surprising that along with her commentaries on contemporary politics, she's also a student of American history. And it's the role of women, women today and in previous eras, that has captured her attention as a writer and author. And I really can't emphasize enough, uh, at least from my own personal vantage point, what a contribution I think she's made to filling in some very big blanks in the story of this nation, uh, specifically the role of women at critical junctures over the last 200 plus years. And Koki and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, and, and I was just saying it's actually infuriating how so many people think the story of America is already complete and really it's just a matter of interpretation and it's so not complete and thank you very much for helping enlarge and enrich that story. Uh, she has relied on letters and journals and other first-hand accounts by and about women. Her books uh, with that uh, background and those resources present an important new dimension to our understanding of the colonial experience, the American Revolution, and now with her newest book, The Civil War. In Capital Dame, she introduces readers to a cast of women, some known, some long forgotten, who wielded great clout in Washington at a perilous time. And she explains how women changed the capital and how the war changed them. And I think one of the sort of fun and perhaps not surprising parts of the book is that, uh, well, when it comes to women's roles, some things just never do change very much after all. But I'm going to let Koki fill you in on the rest. It's a colorful, dramatic, hugely important story about the impact of women on this country. If you haven't gotten a copy, we have plenty up front. She'll be happy to sign them afterwards. And please uh, give a warm welcome to Koki Roberts. Well, thank you, Lisa. Lisa is a, a, a neighbor of mine as well. Uh, we, we live very close to each other. Uh, I live in the house that I grew up in. She's newer to the neighborhood than she, I, I probably moved there before she was born. But, um, but, but, the, um, but what a fabulous contribution Lisa and Brad have made to this community, really. I mean, it's just really wonderful. And, and in, in addition to taking on this, this now legendary store, a legend in uh, Washington, doing the National Book Fair was really a challenge and one that was well met. Um, didn't you guys go? My grandsons are here. You have to pay attention. You have to sit up and pay attention. <laughs> but um, it, it really, they did a fabulous job. Um, my college roommate is here. You see, it's all the old, and, and another college classmate. Well, you know, it's the old gang. It's, um, uh, and and uh, Barbara Stevens, my roommate, when I was in college, helped me 
type my papers late at night, uh, and she couldn't help me finish this book, and it was really upsetting to me <laughs> because I was very late in getting it in. But um, but it was great fun to do. I uh, I appreciate your words, Liz, about the women. I started on this quest. Uh, about women in history really as a result of, of growing up with my mother. And uh, many of you knew her, Lindy Boggs. Uh, she, uh, I watched when I was growing up here in, in post-World War II Washington, the, uh, the women, my mother and her cohorts, uh, running everything. You know, they they ran um, the political conventions, they ran the the voter registration drives, they ran their husbands' campaigns, they ran their offices, um, and along with the African American women in Washington, they ran all the social service agencies. And um, and in fact, when my father was killed in a plane crash, and my mother then ran for Congress, she called uh, Lady Bird Johnson, who was one of her closest, closest friends, and one of this group of remarkable women. And uh, she told her which, that she was going to run for Congress, and she didn't want Mrs. Johnson to read it in the paper. And Lady Bird said, well, that's nice, Lindy, but how are you going to do it without a wife? <laughs> and, um, and that was you know, a very good question. And one that Mama had a hard time with, because she ended up playing both roles, of course. and. Um, uh, making it twice as hard, but it was uh, it wasn't an experience uh, and a way of growing up that really did give me a deep appreciation uh, for the women in uh, in politics now and for women in history. And I got very particularly interested in the women of the Revolutionary period because I have to deal with the founding fathers all the time. Uh, I mean, yes, I know them all by first names. I'm, I'm not crazy about them. Uh, I, I admire them, but, you know, once you start reading their wives' letters, you like them less. Uh, but, um, the, um, but, the, but that's an era that, you know, if you cover Congress and politics as long as I have, you, you deal with constantly. And, and they're invoked constantly, right? The founders said this. The people who say that, by the way, mainly in the United States Senate, um, have it wrong about 99.9% .9 of the time. And so, you know, I was always going back to see what they actually did say uh, about religion in the public square or the right to bear arms or whatever it was now, why you have to be an American, a child of American citizens to be president. It turns out you don't have to be born in America. Canada will do, um, but which seems to have put the whole Kenya thing to rest. But um, <laughs> it's interesting. But um, so I, you know, I had gotten to know the men, and I uh, started to be very curious about what the women were up to, and I really didn't know anything. And so I went back to find out, and the reason I didn't know anything is because it really hadn't been written. Uh, with the exception of a couple of good biographies of Abigail Adams, uh, there really wasn't anything. Now, since then, there's a few quite good books have come out, but it wasn't true at the time. You can't hear? Okay. Thank you. Is that any better? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, uh, I, so that's how I, I wrote Founding Mothers and then the sequel, Ladies of Liberty, uh, taking us through John Quincy Adams inauguration, which is literally the next generation. So I, there, there I was, and I had done it, and I was happy with it, but then uh, the publisher wanted a Civil War book. I never intended to write a Civil War book. First of all, all of my relatives were on the losing side, <laughs> and um, then they did all fight and you know, lost, and, um, and it's an awful war. You know, it's, it's 600,000 dead Americans fighting each other. Uh, but they really did want a book, so I started really puzzling around about what it would be. What I did know is that whatever it would be, I would love the letters. Because women's letters are fabulous. They are so much better than men's letters. It's just, no, they really are. Because the men knew that they were doing something extraordinary. Um, even the ones who weren't. And they, um, <laughs> and they, and they, so they wrote with that in mind. So their, their letters are studied and edited and often pompous uh, and focused and all that. The women just wrote letters. 
So they would they were full of politics. The women were deeply political, but they also would talk about the economic situation, or who was having and all too often losing babies, um, and um, uh, fashion. All of it, all of life, is in the letters, and they are funny and they're frank and feisty and honest uh, in ways that you don't find with the, the men. And my personal, and, and, and most of them have never been published before. So I'm always on this quest, you know, to see, I don't know what I'm getting. And so I'm reading along and seeing what it is, you know, what, I'm, what I can learn. And my personal favorite actually remains one from, the, um, from Ladies of Liberty. It was a letter written by Louisa Catherine Adams uh, who was the wife of John Quincy Adams, and um, she it was here in Washington in 1820, and he was Secretary of State, and she had written, she, she wrote these chatty letters home to old John Adams, Abigail had died and he was lonely. And um, so she had written uh, him at one point saying it was her vocation to get her husband elected president. And uh, so it's the year 1820, it's the year of the Missouri Compromise. Congress stayed in session much longer than usual uh, because of hammering out the compromise. And finally they adjourn. She goes to a meeting of the Orphan Asylum trustees. Dolly Madison had, with the local women here, founded the Orphan Asylum after the um, British invasion in 1814. So she goes to meet the trustees, and one of the trustees says to her that they're going to need a new building. And she said, why? What are you talking about? And the woman said, the session had been very long. The fathers of the nation had left 40 cases to be provided for by the public, and our institution was the most likely to be called upon to maintain this illicit progeny. Forty pregnant women left behind, and there were only about 200 members of Congress. Now, you know, some of them could have been recidivists, I don't know, but anyway. So she says to John Adams, I recommended a petition to Congress next session for that great and moral body to establish a foundling institution and should certainly move that the two additional dollars a day which they have given themselves as an increase in pay may be appropriated as a fund toward the support of the institution. Now, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. And I mean, when I discovered this, I just couldn't believe it. And uh, I, so I, I I knew, I knew whatever this book was going to be, uh, that I would come upon wonderful letters like that. And it turns out, in fact, uh, her daughter-in-law, Abigail Brooks Adams, who was married to Charles Francis Adams, who was here briefly in Congress and then became the Union's ambassador to the court of St. James and was very instrumental in keeping the British from recognizing the Confederacy. But while they were here in Washington, it was the infamous 36th Congress, which was the Secession Congress. And she's writing home these unbelievably frank letters to her son, Henry Adams, and she says of President Buchanan that he is a heavy old toad, and uh, and the the Senate behave like children and silly ones at that. Now, I mean, we, we can get behind this. And um, but again, my favorite. I would advise any young woman who wishes to have an easy, quiet life not to marry an Adams. So, um, so you know, I I knew whatever I did that the. Um, that the letters would be great, but I still didn't know what the book was. And so I started thinking about, again, my own growing up here uh, after World War II. And uh, the effects of the war were very physically present. Uh, the, the mall was covered with what were called temporary buildings, and uh, they had initially gone up in World War I, and then more had been added. Uh, in World War II. I remember asking my parents what temporary meant because they didn't seem to be going anywhere. And, um, and they were there for a long time until those big buildings were built on Independence Avenue. So you saw physically how the war had increased the government and, and made the city a bigger, more important city. And we knew the stories, or at least learned the stories of Rosie the Riveter and the government girls who came into town in large numbers to stay off the bureaucracy. 
And uh, and I knew, uh, because again, I'd covered it um, and written about it, that I hadn't covered the 40s conventions, but I had written about them, um, that um, it after the war, the women's movement really did come into uh, focus and the Equal Rights Amendment was introduced in the first Republican uh, uh, convention after the war and then the Democrats the next time around. So it had, it had spurred on uh, the women's movement. And there was this myth that women had all gone home after the war, but it just simply wasn't true. Uh, women were occupying all kinds of positions that they had never occupied before. 60,000 women took advantage of the GI Bill and, uh, and brought themselves to where we are now, where the majority of college graduates are female. So I started thinking, I wonder if the Civil War had a similar impact on the role of women, the place of women, and the role of Washington. And as I started to do the research, I found out absolutely and dramatically so. And so that's the book. And uh, it turned out to be fascinating to, to learn about and to, and to write. Rosie the Riveter women came in to work in the arsenals and uh, all over the North, but in Washington, uh, they were a couple of dozen very young women were killed in a horrible arsenal explosion. And uh, the newspaper stories about it are just horrific because they, um, the take they uncover the women the next day and their bodies are unrecognizable but uh, the reporter says but they were trapped in their hoop skirts so there they were in Washington in the middle of July doing this incredibly dangerous work of, of stuffing the ammunition of actually creating the ammunition and um, and there they were dressed as the proper ladies for the 19th century. It was a huge funeral led by the president and the secretary of war. And there is a very beautiful uh, monument to them at the congressional cemetery. But the president giving, um, giving due to the huge uh, contribution they had made to the war effort. Government girls, same thing. Women started arriving in Washington just as they did in World War II, mainly initially just to make a living because the men were gone, they needed a job. But um, then it was fortuitous for the women, just as they started showing up, Congress authorized the printing of paper money to pay for the war. And the money, as I mean, many of you have probably been to see it be made, it's so much fun. You know, it comes off the machines in these great huge uh, sheets. And of course now the bills are cut up by machines, but then it required somebody sitting with a pair of scissors, you know, <laughs> cutting out each bill. And uh, the treasurer of the United States, General Skinner, said, women are just better with scissors than men are. <laughs> and, uh, and he also allowed us how he could pay the women less, uh, <clears throat> something that I've had several bosses say along the way uh, in a career. But um, so you had, uh, by the end of the war, one of the women journalists saying, uh, and she documents it, that there were women in every department of government. And that had just not been true before, and they stayed, of course. And of course, a woman journalist is another thing. There were women um, who came to Washington to cover the, the politics and the war. Some had been here before, one Jane Swisshelm, uh, who was an abolitionist and a suffragist, and and a bomb thrower, basically. But she was the first woman who had been allowed to uh, report out of the Capitol Press Gallery but before the war. But she was soon kicked out of the Capitol Press Gallery because she wrote vicious truths. Um, <laughs> you know, she, she actually wrote that Daniel Webster was a drunk. And, um, and the men were horrified. And again, I, was, I found it so recognizable because the same thing had happened when we women journalists uh, started covering political campaigns and got on the bus. And, you know, the boys on the bus had taken a vow of omerta and, uh, and we hadn't. And, uh, you know, we actually wrote what went on on the campaign pain trail and I remember I remember once coming back after some trip and I was on the Brinkley show and of course I was the only woman and um, and I said something along the lines of well you know we, we do report everything what the candidates up to you know it's relevant and I said and of course we tell stories from the trail and a lot of our best friends are the other correspondents wives <laughs> 
and this look of total terror <laughs> came over the guy's faces. And the, the timekeeper for the show said there was 45 solid minutes of silence <laughs> while they absorbed this piece of information. And then there are women you do know about, but you probably don't know quite how remarkable they are. Uh, women like Dorothea Dix and Clara Barton. Uh, before the war, Dorothea Dix had come to Washington to lobby for a bill to, um, for the federal government. She wanted the government to put aside 12 million acres for the mentally ill and uh, poverty stricken. And she'd get it, and, and the Senate, she was already so influential because of her work for the mentally ill that the uh, Senate set aside an office in the Capitol for her from which to uh, lobby. And she'd get it through one house, one session, another house, another session. Finally, she gets it with both houses of Congress, and President Pierce vetoes it. So she left, but before she left, she got Congress to establish St. Elizabeth's, uh, which was called the Government Hospital for the Insane. Then she comes back during the war, and she goes to the Surgeon General and says that she will be the superintendent of female nurses. Well, there were no female nurses. Nursing wasn't open to women. That was not a, an open field. And, um, and the Surgeon General was terrified of her and basically said, yes, ma'am, you, you go do that. And, um, uh, and then after the, and, and by the way, not only was nursing not open, there was, a, the field of medicine was barely touched because women had not been allowed into medical schools and all those. So there were, there were basically three or four women doctors by the time of the war. One of them, Mary Walker, was a surgeon she came here to Washington uh, to, uh, to get a job with the Union Army, but she ended up having to volunteer. She dressed like a man, so they arrested her all the time, you know, just on general principles. And um, she is still, Mary Walker, is still the only woman to have won the Medal of Honor. And uh, she was a surgeon in, in the Union Army. And, um, and then Clara Barton, uh, is a, one of those stories where she was from a New England family, a suffragist abolitionist mother. She always chafed against the fact that she didn't make as much as men. And she, um, and she then came to Washington to get a job with the government to try to make more money. And she did actually for a while, she worked at the patent office, make as much as men. Then the war happens, Massachusetts troops show up in the Capitol, in fact, in the Capitol. They were bivouacked in the Senate chamber. And, um, and she started uh, bringing them supplies and nursing them and reading them newspapers and all of that. So they started writing home and saying, there's this woman here who can do all this. So people started from all over the country started sending her supplies. She went to the, the quartermaster general and said, I've got three warehouses full of supplies. So he sent her where she wanted to go, which was to the front. And she was incredibly brave and intrepid through all the wars around here, particularly Antietam, which remains, of course, the single worst day in American history in terms of casualties. And then um, after the war, one of the last acts that Lincoln performed was to uh, allow her to set up a missing persons bureau. Uh, and so she found missing soldiers, but she also identified the graves of tens of thousands of soldiers so that they were given the respect of a marked grave and not left unknown. Uh, then she goes to Europe and discovers something called the Red Cross and comes back here and establishes the American Red Cross. Now, this is one of the many things that drives me crazy in history books. I mean, Lissa says they infuriate her, this history. This, this kind of statement just sends me around the bend, you know. And then she established the American Red Cross. Really? You know, was it hard? Did, did anything go before that? You know, was, was, was there a story there? Um, and of course there was. Uh, and she, it, she was able to get a Red Cross going in the United States, but it didn't have the clout of being a, uh, aligned with the International Red Cross, where it could really do some work because the Senate first had to ratify the Geneva Conventions in order for them to be part of the International Red Cross. For two decades, she lobbied the Senate and finally got the Senate to ratify the Geneva Treaty. 
She's then the representative to Geneva, puts in what's called the American Amendment, which allows, still called that, which allows the uh, Red Cross to go into disaster zones as well as war zones. So right now in Nepal, after the earthquake, with the Red Cross there, it's the result of the lobbying that Clara Barton did 130 years ago. So yeah, it's really a wonderful story. And um, so all of these things were uh, sh sh showing me how similar it was to World War II and, and also just fascinating me. And of course, what I was, the people I was most interested in because of what I do for a living and also how I grew up was the political women. And they were just uh, wonderful to read about. Before the war, uh, the society was really ruled by Southern women. They were a lot more fun, if the truth be told. And, um, and they, um, and they referred to themselves as bells, and uh, there was a certain amount of vying among them, but there was also a great deal of friendship. And their letters are full of politics, but their letters are also, again, very, very um, frank. And at one point when um, Adele Cutts, who they all loved, she was Dolly Madison's great niece, and she was brilliant, and she was beautiful, and she was kind and uh, all the women write about her. They all liked her. And she was going to, she, they discovered she was gonna marry Stephen Douglas. None of them could stand Stephen Douglas. And, <laughs> and uh, he was considerably older and had a couple of kids. And so Verena Davis, Jefferson Davis's wife, writes home to her mother and says, the dirty speculator and party trickster, broken in health by drink, with his first wife's money, buys an elegant, well-bred woman because she is poor and her father is proud. And Verena says, fortunately, Washington is getting a new water system, so sparing his wife's olfactories, Douglas may wash a little little oftener. <laughs> if he don't, his acquaintance will build larger rooms with more perfect ventilation. <laughs> now, you know the men don't write that Stephen Douglas stank. And um, uh, so he still defeated Lincoln a couple of years later for the Senate. But um, but she, she turns out to be one of the most delightful women. Uh, and her letters are quite wonderful. She stayed friendly throughout the war, even after uh, the, her the state seceded, Mississippi was where he was from. Mississippi seceded and he became president of the Confederacy. And she actually knew from the beginning, she wrote to her mother that there was no way that this was gonna work. Uh, the, you know, she, she just did an analysis, says, well, you know, we don't have enough manufacturing, we don't have enough railroads, we can't win this war. But I'll do my duty, she said. And so off she went to Richmond. But she stayed friendly with her friends uh, in the North, particularly Elizabeth Blair Lee, who we all know uh, from Blair House and, and uh, Montgomery Blair and all of that. And, and Montgomery Blair was her brother. He was in Lincoln's cabinet, of course. Her father, Francis Preston Blair, was a Lincoln a confidant and advisor. Her other brother, Frank Blair, was a uh, congressman. Her husband, Phillips Lee, was Robert E. Lee's cousin, but he was an officer in the Union Navy. And because he was in the Navy, she wrote to him almost every day. So there are thousands of letters. And her wartime letters are actually published. But there are plenty more on both sides of the war, all happily at Princeton. Um, but uh, so her letters really give you a sense of what's happening here all through the war and how much danger Washington was in, which was something I really had not focused on, particularly at the beginning of the war, when there was every expectation that the Southerners would just come in and, and um, uh, burn the place down. And, and until the forts were built around it, you know, Fort Reno and Fort Stevens and all the ones would go by, uh, it was really unsafe. And um, I found uh, a um, diary, an unpublished diary from 1861, that first year, of the woman who was the farmer at Rosedale. And so she really talks about how scary it is. And, and she's a Confederate sympathizer, as were most of the people in town. And, um, and so she's telling her children, just keep quiet for God's sake, you know, because, you know, loose lips sink, sink ships. But in her case, she was afraid they'd say something intemperate and the Union Army would get them. Um, 
And she was completely cut off from her children in Virginia. So you really get a sense of that, uh, of somebody you can recognize because she's right here at Rosedale. Uh, Elizabeth, Lizzie Lee was one of the few people who tried to befriend Mary Lincoln. Not easy. Uh, she was really difficult. I think today she'd probably be diagnosed as bipolar. She was certainly mercurial. Uh, she let her views be known uh, to everybody about you know how she who she thought was awful in the cabinet, which was pretty much the cabinet. And um, and she kept making enemies. Um, and the press was all over her. Uh, they followed her everywhere, wrote about everything she did, all of her shopping, all of that. She was accused of leaking the State of the Union message to the New York Herald, either in exchange for good publicity or money, depending on whose story you're reading. The Congress launched an investigation into the First Lady's communications. <clears throat> uh, so you see, things don't change. And, um, and the president actually went to the Hill and said, because it was a Republican Congress, he could do this. He said, you know, um, uh, please don't subpoena my wife. It will be very embarrassing to me. But they did a full investigation, and it was not, you know, pretty. The women of Washington really didn't uh, like her, and it was somewhat reciprocated. So her best friend became Elizabeth Keckley. And Elizabeth Keckley was a former slave who had bought her freedom and come here. Uh, she was a very, very talented uh, dressmaker, couturier. She ran a very profitable business. All of these prominent women went to her and had her make their, their best dresses. So Mary Lincoln wanted the best and hired her, and they became very good friends. And um, Mrs. Keckley was in the conversations with the President and First Lady. Uh, the First Lady also told her many things herself. She helped take care of Mary Lincoln after Willie died, and then after the President was shot. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln was in the White House for two months and out of her mind. And um, Mrs. Keckley took care of her then and then took her back to Illinois and got her set up. And then she wrote a tell-all book. I mean, it, it, it's really remarkable how things don't change. And, um, and uh, of course, that severed the relationship. Um, and it also ruined her business because other people were worried that she might do the same. Um, but it allowed her to then pursue uh, her, her real passion, which was uh, social service, because she had understood as a formerly enslaved person what uh, the situation was with the, the, first it was escaped slaves coming in or those who had gone to the Union Army called contrabands, and then after emancipation, freedmen. And she understood that there were many, particularly the elderly, who had no wherewithal to get a job or housing or anything. So she established a relief organization. And because she had such prominent friends, was able to raise a good deal of money and awareness of the issue. And so she was able to then, uh, after, after her business fell apart, to really uh, throw her energies into the Freedmen Relief, as many other women actually came to town to work in as well. And that was, that was what really struck me in, in the end, was how uh, after the war, as a result of the experiences during the war, these women did move out front uh, and take on their own causes and their own issues. And uh, they had been very involved and very influential behind the scenes, but now they were marching on to the public stage themselves. And so Verena Davis, for instance, um, after the war, after she got her husband out of jail, which was, you know, because he had been put in jail as part of the conspiracy to assassinate Lincoln, which was a crock, but, you know, there he was. She, she prevailed upon Andrew Johnson to get him out of jail, which is another thing you cannot get over in this book. How these women are in and out of the White House all of the time, just giving the president's unshirted grief. I mean, it is fabulous. I am so jealous. It is, you know, they, they just, they have complete access. And, um, and so after she gets her husband out of jail, it's, they have a tough time and he finally dies. And she, 
uh, decides to move to New York, where she had a job with the New York World as a journalist. And it was a huge scandal, right? The first lady of the Confederacy moving to New York City. <laughs> and people offered her a house in Richmond and all that. And she said she didn't want that. She wanted to move to New York. And she had never been fully accepted by the South. Her grandfather was the governor of New Jersey. And she was olive complected. She was never quite fair enough for the perfect Southern Belle. So as she's moving to New York, she writes to her daughter and says, I am free, brown, and 64. I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> But then she got there, and she was a journalist and ran something of a salon, but she befriended Julia Grant. And it was page one news in all of the newspapers when she and Mrs. Grant met. And, uh, and then she went to the dedication of the Grant Memorial very publicly. Because what she was engaged in was a very public series of acts of reconciliation of bringing the sections of the country back together. And she was doing this. She wasn't trying to influence a man to do it. She was doing it herself with her own voice very publicly. And similarly, some of the other bells, the same thing. There's a wonderful, delightful woman named uh, Virginia Clay who wrote a book about herself called A Bell of the 50s. And, um, and after the war, she became uh, an ardent suffragist and was on platforms with Horace Greeley and William, Mrs. William Lloyd Garrison. People, her husband, who was a senator from Alabama, had fought bitterly before the war, and now she was she was with them again in this public act of reconciliation, but also with a cause. Uh, that she felt that she could use her voice to promote. And all the newspapers say she, that her, her voice was terribly important. And one of the great things now is that you can read all the newspapers. Um, they're online, and so you can waste days, uh, you know, because they're so much fun to read. And, and that interested me, too, because when I was growing up, it was always said that a proper lady was only in the paper when she was born, married, and died. And, um, and these women were in the papers all the time. They were written about constantly. And um, so she was uh, very much out in front again after the war. Another Southerner, Sarah Pryor, who uh, went to New York, became a noted writer, and uh, created several important relief organizations, worked with Elizabeth Blair Lee, who had stayed here and stayed true to the Union, uh, to help establish the Daughters of the American Revolution, again in an act of reconciliation, going back to an earlier time when the country was together and uh, had a common cause. And so uh, they really did uh, stand there on their own two feet in front of the public and, and make their cases with their own voices, having been greatly empowered by the war. And uh, Clara Barton, in looking back on it at a Memorial Day address a couple of decades later, uh, said, woman was at least 50 years in advance of the normal position which continued peace would have assigned her. So it is quite a story. I, I loved getting to know these women. I know you will, too. Uh, thank you for letting me share them with you, and I'd be delighted to take your questions. Thank you. Questions? There's a microphone right there. Why does it seem like in history the women always seem to be conveniently uh, deleted from the history? Why are the women conveniently deleted from the history? Because the men don't care. Uh, you know, this <laughs> but um, as Lissa said earlier, it's, it's infuriating. It's also inaccurate. You can't tell history leaving out half of the human race and have an accurate history. Uh, so I, you know, I just feel, yeah, thank you. So, uh, but also it's so much more fun to have them. They're, they're, they're just more interesting. Thanks. <laughs> so, go ahead. I, I thought you and Mr. Beschloss were terrific at the National Archives a couple of weeks ago. Oh, it was a wonderful you. program. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned there, kind of in passing, how many of these people uh, either went to visitation school yeah. or had a role there. Can you talk a little bit more visitation, about that? Visitation, 
uh, stayed in operation all through the war. It had uh, always accepted girls of every faith and of all regions, and actually remarkably quite a few stayed through the war. Um, the uh, most of the schools and, and uh, hotels and everything were taken over either to house troops or as hospitals because Washington became one great stinking hospital during the war because everybody coming in from all the battles around came into Washington. Visitation was untouched because Winfield Scott, who had been you know, the chief general before the war, his daughter had become a visitation nun and she was buried there. So he protected visitation, and um, it was never taken over, but it, it continued to operate all through the war. And a lot of these women went there. Yeah. Let's get some girls asking questions, <laughs> but you go ahead. <laughs> you found some wonderful things about uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. Did you have an unexpected favorite source for Mary Todd Lincoln? No, you know, I didn't really spend that much time delving into Mary Todd Lincoln because she she has been written about a, a good deal. Um, obviously, I had to deal with her. She was the first lady. Um, so I was, I, I, the parts that I found interesting were what other people who were uh, contemporaries wrote about her because, again, it was first person uh, and they, they saw it. Now, they all had views but and Elizabeth Keckley's book is very uh, eye-opening about the White House and what was going on in the White House but then also um, her niece so toward the end of the war Mary Lincoln's half-sister came and stayed in the White House for about a week her husband was in the Confederate Army and he had been killed. Mm -hmm. Mary Lincoln's brothers and half, brother, er, half brothers and, and brothers-in-law were all in the Confederate Army, and which made her suspect to the North the way Verena Davis was suspect to the South. Um, and so this half-sister came and stayed, and that woman's daughter later wrote a book uh, defending her Aunt Mary, but also it was very clear from that book how very crazy Mary Lincoln was at that point. Her, her sister had kept a diary, and she, during her week in the White House, or 10 days, whatever, and uh, Mary had come in and told her that Willie came to her bed at night and all of that. And she did have seances in the White House. Yeah. You, know, so. you mentioned uh, Kickley and Stephen Douglas. Uh, Keckley is the only one that I know of who mentions that Mary tells that Stephen Douglas courted her yes. at the same time as Abraham Lincoln long before they were in the debate. Right. No, he did. That's true. Uh, Stephen Douglas did uh, woo and lose Mary, Mary Todd. Um, uh, she, was, she was looking for a president. And, uh, he, <laughs> and no, she really was. And even though everybody thought Stephen Douglas was the presidential material guy, she saw something she could mold in Abraham Lincoln. So and it was a love match. They absolutely loved each other, but it was just tortured. She, she yeah. you know, may have been crazy, but she picked the... She was smart, and she was politically acute. Mm -hmm. She was just, she she had a difficult time. She knew better. I mean, she, you know, she did She pick picked the better, yeah. <laughs> Oh. Yes. Um, the, what, the tales that you've told so far are just so interesting. And I actually have already bought your book and started Good. it, but haven't gotten far enough to really read some of this. But in any event, I just was thinking about, any, is there any chance of a documentary about some of these fantastic women? A documentary producer would have to decide to do a documentary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's not me. Okay. Koki, I'm going to jump in until somebody else goes to the mic. Um, I'm assuming there are women that you were interested in writing about that perhaps you couldn't because the documentation just wasn't well, there? Well, Adele Cutts is really the, the main one there. So I was, I, I wanted to stay in Washington because otherwise you're just too diffuse. Um, and also I do Washington well, you know. And so, um, no, because one of the things I've learned is that quite interested in reading history is that academic historians often get the history right and the politics wrong. And, uh, you know, it really is helpful to, to know how to analyze politics in order to, to write these books. And um, so I wanted to have sort of equal numbers of Northerners and Southerners. 
So, uh, and, and in reading 19th century books, the same women started being mentioned. And so, uh, so then I did go searching for their papers. And uh, Adele Cutts, I never found any papers. I found the University of Chicago had letters to her, mainly after Stephen Douglas died. Mm -hmm. Um, and a few others, you know, Sarah Pryor, who's one of the women I write about, sent her a recipe. It was sent her a recipe. She, Sarah Pryor seemed to send people uh, Virginia hams. And, um, and she sent her a recipe that said, unless you boil it overnight in champagne, as they do in New Orleans, <laughs> this is the recipe. But, um, but I, I found hardly anything at all written by her. But she's still in there because everybody else talked about her so much. And, and the newspaper, when she died, the newspaper was referred to her as a popular icon. So she was a personage. You know. she, but for the most of the others, I was able to find papers, and a lot of them unpublished papers. What what did you think you would have found about Adele Cuts that you? I just would have liked to have known what she had to say. I don't hear her voice. Yeah. You know, everybody else likes her, and they say she's really smart, and she's and she's wonderful, and she's this and she's that. Every so often, I mean, after Douglas died, and the whole world was wooing her, because uh, she she was considered a great beauty, she um, she did tell Frances Preston Blair that um, uh, that you know she didn't want to marry, she she didn't want to settle, and so. She did eventually remarry a, a union officer and had six children. No. I just wanted to, can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to ask, how did you find all these letters? Did you have to write across the country? No, you oh. know, modern technology is a wonderful thing. Um, from, so I, Founding Mothers came out in 2004, so I guess I started working on that, you know, around 2000, around 2001. And, um, then you really did have to go, you know, to places. But now you can see uh, you can see where the guys' papers are, and then from Ms., you know Mrs. Google does that for you, and um, <laughs> and um, the um, and then you you get in touch with those libraries or historic societies and ask if they have the women's papers if they're not listed. And then they have become far, far more accommodating uh, because now they know what I'm up to. Uh, um, and um, so they uh, can then scan papers. I mean, this is for a fee, which is fair enough. They're working. Uh, so they can scan papers and send them to you. Now, what you get at that point is 18, uh, 19th century handwritten letters uh, that are written horizontally and vertically. So reading them is another matter altogether. And I actually did have to hire somebody to read them. I, I really couldn't decipher a lot. Uh, I guess that leads me to think this is something that educators are very concerned about because without children being taught script today, right. they're not going to be able to read the letters. Well, and what letters are they going to be to read? Also, another problem. Um, but the, I mean, that's one of the great things about your printer, you know, is printer. they, <laughs> because they have a printer where, where grandparents come in and write memoirs for their grandchildren, which is wonderful. Um, and oral histories like StoryCorps on NPR and all of that are also ways of recording this history because we are going to have a dearth of written materials. And um, I, I, I mean, I guess if somebody's subpoenaed, you can get an Instagram out of the cloud, I assume, but, um, but it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, I, I, I have to ask one more question because I can't help myself. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance for this, but um, uh, given the 2016 presidential race and the gender dynamics that we're all aware of, I'm just wondering if there is a woman in your book who transplanted 100 plus, 150 years later, uh, whatever it is, yeah, it's um, <laughs> That's why would it's be presidential there. material yeah. today. Yeah, sure. I, I Absolutely. I mean, I think that um, um, somebody like Verena Davis, uh, uh, Elizabeth Blair Lee, I mean, if they, if they were in the right situation, they certainly were knowledgeable enough and, and politically astute. Um, in fact, the newspaper said of Elizabeth Blair Lee when she died, very few women have had so broad a political experience. Uh, 
And so, I mean, I found the obituaries fascinating because I was surprised there even were obituaries, you know. And um, and the only person I couldn't find an obituary for was Elizabeth Keckley, which tells you about the times. But um, but the um, but I think that you know, given the ability to uh, have political help and and run and stuff, that they could have done it easily. I, I guess you could make the argument that some of those women, in fact, had to deal with so many more constraints and still got a lot done. Absolutely, but they might have even not been better to mention suited. that they would lose children all the time. I mean, it's it's, it's heartbreaking to read how many children they lost you know and of course during the war everybody was losing children but but little children I mean both Verena Davis and Mary Lincoln uh, lost sons who were like two years old at the time and then Willie Lincoln of course died in the White House so did Verena Davis's 10 year old die in Richmond falling off the top of a building uh, Louisa Meggs is in the book her husband Montgomery Meggs we all know in Washington um, she one one October lost a three year old and a ten year old in some disease that came through. I mean, so just living through the day was incredibly difficult, and still they were as interested and involved in politics and in in policy as they were. I just find that so incredibly admirable. I mean, they couldn't vote. Married women couldn't own property. They were the property of their husbands. And, uh, and still, their enormous dedication uh, to, the, 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 to the country and to, the, uh, to making it all come out right. So. I'm just wondering if we have, we have time for one more question, if anybody has one. Um, okay. Here, I'm going to hand you this so that okay. you can. But actually, actually, do you mind just going, because I'm remembering this is not attached to the <laughs> C-SPAN TV. So. Hi, Ms. Robert. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, in hearing about these remarkable women who accomplished so much in the face of so much discrimination, lack of opportunity, what do you see now, currently, as being continuing odds that women face? Well, there are odds. I mean, you know, there, there's still, there still is discrimination. It's still very difficult uh, in some fields, uh, and it's also <laughs> still true uh, I, I personally think the single biggest problem is that the workplace needs to be far more caretaker friendly uh, because you cannot have uh, the best and the brightest, meaning the majority of college graduates and the vast majority of graduate school vet graduates, uh, not able to be as productive and uh, as uh, able to do their best work as possible and still be a competitive society. So I think that that is a, a, a challenge that really needs to be met. But I also do feel, and don't take this, you know, don't get upset. Um, <laughs> modern women, and men too, but modern women are a bunch of sissies. I mean, you know, compared to what, what these women went through, it's just remarkable. I mean, when somebody says to me, I can't do it all, I feel like saying, meet your great grandmother, you know, and talk to her about it. Uh, because really, they did do it all, and they didn't complain about it. No. They complained a little bit, but. You know. <laughs> okay, thank well, you. Well, this is uh, it's a great book. I hope you all will pick it up. Um, Koki's happy to sign, and uh, I just want to thank her again for both coming and also for really, as I said earlier, helping enrich our understanding of a very important aspect of our own history. Um, so I don't Thank know if there's another it. book in you, but if there <laughs> is, I hope you'll come back to Politics and Thank Prose. You. And um, if you wouldn't mind just folding up your chairs when we're done and putting them to the side, that will expedite the signing line. See, this is, Thank this you is so what much. we had in convent school. Pick up your chair. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you very much.